right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cosmic Coffee from Lowell Observatory. I'm Jeff Hall, an astronomer and director of the observatory. Um, and joining me today, this is one of the uh, shows we're doing on astronomical techniques and instrumentation, one of the threads we're following this year through Cosmic Coffee. I'm being joined this morning by Dr. Gerard Van Bell of our faculty, who's uh, been on Cosmic Coffee Board. I think the last one we did was like spaceships in... Uh, oh, yeah. That was a really fun one. So go back and look at, at how spaceships have been depicted in in movies, uh, realistically sometimes and sometimes very much not so. <laughs> Didn't we also do one on the moon, like the moon in science fiction or something like that? Or maybe it was just spaceships, yeah. I think, I think that was part of that one yeah. on, on how spaceships have been... Uh, depicted. And clearly, this is obviously the morning after St. Patrick's Day, Gerard. Yeah. yeah, I've learned there are some things that one must try at least once in life, and, and this is not it. But uh, yeah, I, it's been an I, exciting I, I, change. It's, it's a good idea. I was, I was thinking we'll go on a staff hair dyeing um, <laughs> uh, episode. I'm, I'm thinking maybe a nice fuchsia would work well for me. And probably you know, we have that uh, the blood drive coming up on the hill. And so we could just have, you know, you know, get your stick and get your color at the same time, you know? Yep, yep. All socially distanced, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, well, anyway, we, we're here this morning to talk about interferometry, um, the astronomical technique of doing interferometry and the kinds of science you can do with it. Gerard is one of the world experts on all things interferometric. I think you've, you've worked on pretty much every functioning interferometer there is these days over your career. All of the major optical ones, that's right, yes. Right, right. So what we're gonna do is, is talk a little bit about how these instruments work and then the sorts of science we can do with these unusual sort of distributed telescopes. This is definitely a telescope, but a very uh, interesting sort of one. And I think what we're gonna do is kind of work our way down from long wavelengths to short and, and show how this can be done in different parts of the spectrum. So if you want to throw up a screen share, Gerard, I guess we can get Yeah, going. let's dive into that. Here we are, can you see that, Jeff? I see it just fine, yep. Yeah, so interferometry is, is basically, if you wanna build a really big telescope, like really big, but um, <laughs> you have a limitation called a budget, um, sometimes you can actually get around your budget limitations by building your big telescope out of small telescopes. And, the, um, this approach has been done actually for quite a while in astronomy uh, at certain wavelengths, certain colors of light. So the, uh, the thing about interferometry is that when you uh, are trying to collect light from many different telescopes and put them together and have them behave like a single telescope, it, uh, it gets progressively harder as you go to the shorter and shorter wavelengths of light. So what are, what are the very longest wavelengths of light? And that would be radio waves. And so Here's a picture of the very large array, the VLA, which is out in Socorro, New Mexico. And this actually has 27 antennas, 27 telescopes, because in radio astronomy, a antenna is your telescope. And um, they are able to link these telescopes together to form one single larger telescope. And uh, it, uh, it may remind you of, of a, um, a movie you might have seen, Jeff, um, because yeah. we have uh, images of Jodie Foster in contact when she's yeah. playing, uh, what was her character's name? Uh, Ellen Arroway, I think it was. Arroway, yeah. Um, and so this is a movie of the book written by Carl Sagan uh, of first contact with, uh, with intelligence outside of, uh, outside of the earth. And so she's one of the, she's the main character who uh, for part of her career is working at the VLA. And um, the, uh, the interesting thing that actually I can point out that's also an advantage of working in the radio is you can observe during the daytime because mm -hmm. the radio waves just come down and, and uh, don't have any uh, interference. Well, not, uh, not any change in the interference between the day and the night. Uh, and so, um, you know, radio astronomers would look at this and cringe because here she has a laptop and other devices which are probably creating radio frequency interference for these telescopes. Um, the VLA is one of these areas where you try to not use your cell phone or have a microwave or any of these sorts of things that might trip off the, uh, the signal. And right, so, right. I think we've talked about things like that in our, our spaceships in, in cinema 
Phil, because when we were talking about the killer asteroid movies, I remember the one with the National Optical Observatory with this giant neon sign out front that says National Observatory right outside the zone. <laughs> exactly how we do it. Um, we have a, a very technical question from, from Chris Georgie asking how many Irish coffees it took to get that dye job. <laughs> uh, you know, the Irish coffee helps out a lot. And uh, especially as you're sitting there stewing in the, the aroma of the, of the dye job, it helps to have something to overcome that, you know? I've also long been amused at how, how incredibly inventive astronomers are in naming our facilities. This is a very large array of telescopes. So what else would you call it but the VLA? And you used to work at the VLT, Gerard, I believe. The very large telescope, and they're building the successor to the VLT, which is the ELT, the uh, extremely large telescope. In fact, the, the telescope they should have built that, oh, yeah. they, that they didn't build was the OWL, OWL. telescope, the, the overwhelmingly large telescope. Yes, yes. Um, there's a good riff on this on X XKCD if you go look at the XKCD comic on yeah. uh, telescope names. I think the, the telescope of the future is going to be the telescope of despair is going to be the final one that astronomers built. Yep, yep. Once we get to the 100 meter class. That's right. right. But anyway, so so right. So we start in these very long wavelengths um, for, for good reason. <laughs> That's right. And so one of the things that we can do with these long wavelengths is um, – Look at, say, a nearby galaxy. This is a galaxy called uh, M87, Messier 87. And with the VLA, you can actually, again, make it pretend like it's one giant telescope and you can zoom in uh, on the center of this thing. Uh, a trick that people have been doing with radio telescopes is the VLA is all at the one site over in Socorro, New Mexico. But you can even actually have other telescopes spread around the Earth. And so this is called the, the Very Long Baseline Array. Again, another a very prosaic name there following on that theme. Um, and so suddenly your telescope is not the size of this site in New Mexico, which is many miles across, mind you. But now suddenly your telescope can be the size of the whole Earth because the antennas, the, the telescopes for this radio telescope, are spread from Guam to Hawaii to uh, Puerto Rico uh, to the South Pole. They're all over the place. And so you get something that's the diameter of the Earth is your diameter of your telescope. And so you can really zoom in on to the center of this thing and start to see what's going on at the center of this, this galaxy, which um, we find in astronomy, we uh, astronomers have been finding that as you zoom in on the core of galaxies, you typically find a super massive black hole. Yep. Black holes are always fun topics in astronomy. Oh yeah. Uh, so, but there there is a problem with this kind of interferometry. Uh, what do you what do you think that is, Jeff? Resolution. Exactly. So, with resolution, uh, the resolution of your telescope goes as two things. Yeah. The size of your telescope, as you make it bigger, your resolution improves. But as you go to longer wavelengths of light, as you go to the radio wavelengths of light, let's say, it goes down. And so in the radio, you could have a super huge telescope, but if you're working at very long wavelengths, it's actually not very good resolution. So um, this is a nice start here, but if you really want to see what's going on at the core of this galaxy, you need a shorter wavelength. And so... Um, the next step down in wavelength that uh, has been done in interferometry for answering questions like this is looking at, um, again, something that is a whole Earth interferometer. So, in fact, um, they've built this thing called the Black Hole Imager, the Event Horizon Telescope. Mm -hmm. And again, there are telescopes all over the globe that get used, but now we're going from radio waves into a shorter wavelength, which is submillimeter. And when you do that, you pick up resolution and suddenly um, the core of that thing we were just looking at it. Now you zoom in even more and you see this. Oh, ah, yes. The famous, the famous M87 image from, um, when was it? A couple of years ago? <clears throat> it was a couple of years ago. That's right. And so this image here, it's not just a donut. Uh, this is actually about the size of our galaxy, oh, sorry, our solar system. So say Pluto would be orbiting over here, uh, just here at the, the event horizon, where you can see material that is surrounding the black hole, but the, um, 
the black hole itself you can't see into, but you can actually see the stuff that is outside the event horizon. The event horizon of a black hole is the point at which light can't escape. But up until that point, the light can escape. And a lot of light usually does escape because material is swirling on in and just the, you know, the friction and the, 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 the grinding the material against each other as it's starting to fall into this black hole at faster and faster speeds before it crosses the event horizon, it's given off a lot of light. And uh, these right. engines at the center of, of, black, of uh, active galaxies are uh, actually quite bright and the, the sort of things that we want to look at. Right. Now, one thing we're going to run into, I'm sure we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but, you know, there's all these trade-offs as you build instruments of different types. So as we go from radio to these shorter wavelengths, of course, we start to, to run into tremendous technical demands of component precision and timing, uh, because that's also tied into the wavelength that you're observing with. That's right. So from the radio to the millimeter and submillimeter, you are building, we're building things that um, as you go to shorter wavelengths, it is getting harder, but you can still, with these interferometers, you can still do one important thing, which is you can collect the light at each telescope, then each telescope can detect the light, and then after the fact, you can mix it to make the one big telescope. When you cross from these long wavelengths down into the shortest wavelengths of light, like the ones, the wavelengths of light that our eyes can see, the optical wavelengths of light, you start to leave that regime of where you can collect, detect, and mix, and you're now much more in a regime of where you have to collect the light and then very carefully put it back together mm -hmm. before you detect it. And then only after that can you do that. And so this is what this looks like. Every optical interferometer has uh, this kind of appearance. Apologies to Gary Larson of the far side. Uh, but basically, optical interferometers, uh, interferometers that work at the same wavelengths of light that our eyes do, um, they are very tricky because you're dealing in mechanical tolerances that are on the order of a wavelength of light. Right. And so with the submillimeter array, um, there are similar sorts of requirements, but those requirements are at submillimeter sorts of distances. I mean, a, a, a millimeter is about as close as you can hold your fingers together without them actually touching. And uh, so a submillimeter is going to be maybe a tenth of that. Yeah. And uh, with optical setups, you're talking more about something that is starting to get on the scale of atoms of where you have to have tolerances. And so they're very tough to get to work, but if you do get them to work, you get some very interesting benefits. So let's look at maybe what one of those sort of things look like. Um, here at Lowell, oh, yeah. we've been uh, operating the NPOI array and uh, this is the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer. Uh, Lowell Observatory is a partner with the Naval Research Lab and the US Naval Observatory in operating this. And what you have is three arms. I mean, this thing is so big, you can see it easily from Google Maps. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and you have these arms of the interferometer, each one that goes out about 750 feet. And along these arms, you can actually place telescopes and send light to the center of the array where it then gets relayed over to this laboratory where the light gets put back together. Right. Basically physically identical here to VLA, just yep. with smaller components. <laughs> and what's interesting, VLA has this Y shaped because um, to move the telescopes around, they can actually take those antennas. These things are uh, basically 100 foot diameter antennas and you can move them far apart, you can bring them close together. It's a lot like changing the zoom on your camera lens. Yep. And so with the VLA, that Y shape is dictated by the fact that these antennas weigh many, many tons and they actually have their own train line to yep. pick these <laughs> things up and move them around. So the, the rail, the straight rails of the train line mean that that's why it has a Y shape. NPOI has a Y shape for similar sorts of architectural reasons, but, but a very different fundamental motivator, which is, um, we don't have trains to move our telescopes around. They're much smaller and you can actually pick them up with a, with a pickup truck, with a crane on a pickup truck. But um, we take the light and we put it into a vacuum tube, a, a tube that has all the air evacuated out of it to relay it to the back end. And that's because 
optical light, when you pass it through air, really gets beat up pretty badly. And uh, it's already had a problem getting to the surface of the Earth through the Earth's atmosphere. And so we just don't want to add to our problems. And so we have these evacuated pipes. And because the pipes are evacuated, that means that this is why we have this Y shape here as well. Um, the thing is, though, with this size of an array, looking at the short optical wavelengths of light, the fact that we're working at such a short wavelength of light, we get about the same resolving power as something that is using the whole Earth at these longer wavelengths of light. Um, it's basically, you know, we're, we're dealing with something that is, I don't know, what's, what's the diameter of the Earth in meters? Um, <laughs> seriously. Actually, <laughs> seriously, you should know this because what was the definition of the meter? So it's like, uh, what has it got to be? Um, the def one Go one ahead. The meter was defined to be one ten millionth of the distance from the pole to the equator. It just rolls off the top of the head, right? It totally rolls off the top of your head. Thanks. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so that's 10 to the seventh. And so uh, our array is about 100, maybe one kilometer across. That's 10 to the third. And so we are 10 to the fourth difference in the size of the Earth to the size of our array. And that's about the difference in wavelength length between here and what we're doing. I've always hated people that could do that kind of stuff off the math off the top of the head. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Question from um, Phil Massey. Hey, Phil. Um, just the, uh, regarding the, the EHT team here, that there was a rumor that they were close to releasing an analogous Im image to M87 of um, Sag A, that this mm. massive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Did that ever transpire? Or are there new rumors about that? I don't recall. Um, yeah, it's ironic. The this. This um, Event Horizon Telescope, this thing that's working from the millimeter working on the whole Earth scale, um, they've been focusing on two main targets, uh, M87, which is a nearby galaxy. It's about 20 megaparsecs away. Mm -hmm. And um, they've also been trying to look at uh, this thing called Sag A star, which is the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And so that's much closer. Um, I think they've had more challenges with that because it's much more time variable. And so they've had to build up a bigger database to, to deal with that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, I can't recall if they've had a, a release of that yet. I think they're still working on that. I'm sure. I've not seen a release to that effect and, and it would have been, it would have made as big a splash as the M87 image for sure. Um, That's right. Now you were talking before, particularly with the, the optical interferometers here, I would detect the light and then it has to be very carefully put back together from these apertures and you can see a little bit even in the Google Maps image how we do that. Yep, yep, right there. Yeah, one of the things we do is to get the light to to interfere, and this is where this is the root at which uh, we call these things interferometers. Um, the light from the object has to be collected by these telescopes, sent to the center of the array and then sent to the lab. And before we put the light back together, um, it actually has to have traveled the same distance from the object of interest, your star, or your black hole, or whatever, to each telescope to the back end. And it has to have made that distance, that has to have made that journey to a matched distance that's a fraction of a wavelength of light. And, uh, and so the optical path difference has to be equal to less than about a micron. That's the wavelength of some of the, the light we're looking at. But the catch is, is so this, this image right now shows looking at NPOI from the top. And so you can imagine if you are a star and you're shining on NPOI and the light is being collected by the telescopes, every single one of them is going to catch the light and the distance from you to the telescope is going to be about the same in all cases. But the stars aren't always overhead. The stars rise in the east and they set in the west. And so if you're a star and you're way over here, you're rising in the east, let's say, your light is gonna get captured by the east arm long before it gets to the west arm. It's gonna enter the system and it's gonna to get to a ray center about the same time that light is just showing up here in the west arm. And so by the time the light gets to the west arm, the light from the east arm is gonna have shot already in the lab long before it. And so we have these things called delay lines. These are things where 
it's like a battery for light where we can take the light from the east arm and we can pipe it straight in here and make it bounce off of mirrors going back and forth and back and forth. In the meantime, the light from the west arm has had time to catch up and it's just getting in here and we can put these delay lines so that they're very short. So it just goes out and back, out and back real quick. And by the time we then get into the laboratory, the distance from the west arm and the distance that it's taken to travel here is about the same as from the east arm because we have these trombones, each one for a, uh, a aperture on the telescope that can be pistoned in and out. And mind you, we're doing all that pistoning with micron accuracy. Yeah. So a micron, let's give you a sense of scale here. If you pluck one of your green hairs off your head, um, you can split it lengthwise about a hundred times, and that's going to be about a micron. Um, yeah. So it's very small, very fine. Even so, you know, these, these long delay lines, you said it's, you know, the light comes back in out of the LDLs and it's about the same, but about the same isn't good enough because this is still a pretty coarse correction. So there's yep. yet another layer of, 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 half length adjustment that we have to do. <clears throat> yeah, and these long delay lines, we can we can pop up mirrors and dial in changes in path length about every 30 feet or so. But then inside the lab here, you'll notice the lab actually has kind of a long L shape to it. Inside this long L shape, we have yet more mirrors that are actually little carts. We have mirrors that are on carts that are basically little trolleys that roll up and down precision rails. And we can move those things anywhere along about 100 feet in length, but with this micron accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the, the true precision on it is usually on the order of about 10 nanometers, which is um, about 100 times finer than a micron. Um, we've actually been running tracking tests this past week uh, in here in the lab, and we're getting uh, on some of the 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 carts were getting, I think, two to three nanometer precision tracking. Um, and to give you a sense of scale there, a, a pretty large atom is going to be on the order of about a tenth of a nanometer in diameter. Right, right. So we're, we're really at fine scales. Yeah, you're down to about 20 atoms or so. And a at this point, a very small fraction of the wavelengths of light, um, even at the optical that we're uh, working yeah. with. Yeah, and once and so this is why everything has to be co-located. This is why we can't, uh, since we have to send the light and put it through these delay lines before we mix it. This is why we can't just scatter the telescopes across the globe right. like we do in the radio. It all has to be co-located so you can put the light together carefully and then be able to re rebuild it. And so if you do that, you can get some very interesting things out of it. So let me show you. Let's yeah. see if this one will come up. Here's an example of a star. Um, this is done by our, our colleagues over the Char Interferometer. Uh, NPOI has also looked at this star, Altair. And this star is on the order of two or three milli arc seconds across. This is about the size of an orange if it were in New York City as seen from Flagstaff. So looking at an orange clear across the country. And... and we, we talked about this particular star. Um, well, no, this is a summer star. Um, uh, mm -hmm. What did we talk about? Um, I don't know, whichever one it was, this is a, a really oblate star. And we've mentioned this before in earlier cosmic coffees that, that very rapidly rotating stars show these really interesting effects because they basically look like eggs if you could go out and fly out to them. That's right, that's right. It, um, it's, it's spinning so fast that, uh, Centripetal acceleration, like that effect you get when you do a tight turn around a corner and it kind of pulls you to the outside of the car, that's starting to compete with gravity. Yeah. So Altair right. is twice the size of the sun. It has twice as much mass as the sun, but it is not spinning once every 30 days like our sun in its very stately manner. Uh, Altair is a bit more frenetic and a bit more of like a, a Tasmanian devil here where it goes around about once every 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And so it's literally trying to rip itself apart. And so its equator is about 20% wider than the pole. And um, it has interesting effects. The, the a star is shining because it has a thermonuclear furnace at the core of the star. But the temperature of the star falls off as you get further, further from that furnace, further from that core. And so the, uh, 
the equator being further from the core than the pole, the equator is actually cooler and therefore dimmer. And so you get a darker color at the equator than at the pole. And this is predicted, it was predicted actually 100 years ago and was uh, first directly observed by uh, a team that I led about 20 years ago. And then uh, about 10 years ago, we made a direct image with the, the char array here. And you can actually see the pole, the actual image shows that it's, it's hot, it shows it's brighter at the pole than at the, equa at the equator. So it's yeah, kind of so neat. These are, these are examples of stars, you know, I, we were talking about this a bit last week with Brian Skiff. You know, these stars are basically point sources, and in general, you can't resolve or image them, but but a few of them you can. You know, the, the really big ones, there's, or, or you know, things like this. Um, if you go all the way back to Cosmic Coffee number one, I see uh, Phil on the call, and we talked about, you know, for instance, Betelgeuse and some of these giant extended things with large spots. We can actually start getting a few pixels across the surface of these things. That's right. That's right. Um, in fact, that's a good segue into showing, um, here, let me show you. So this is what NPOI looks like. Uh, our colleagues over at, on Mount Wilson, overlooking LA, there's, there's an array called the Chara array, which is similar-ish. It's about uh, two thirds the size of the full physical extent of NPOI. Um, and they have, again, a L-shaped building with delay lines in here where carts move up and down rails. Um, they've actually really been at the forefront of the, the stellar imaging game. And so uh, in addition to that image of Chara, of, of, of Altair, uh, here's an example of one that they've managed to, um, instead of just taking a snapshot, they took an image of this star uh, once every day for about three weeks. This is a star called Zeta Andromeda. Okay, let me pull it up for you again so you can see it spin. And so they actually stitched together all these images and you can actually see the surface of the star here. Right. And uh, they're able to see places where there are spots on the star, like right here, where this rotates on by. Um, stars like our sun have spots on them. Uh, some stars like Zeta Andromeda here, um, not only do they have spots, but the spots are actually much, much larger relative to the disk of the star than with our sun. Yeah, we were uh, Brian and I were talking about exactly this a bit towards the end of last week's show. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Stellar Activity Cycles program here, and you know this this right here is a huge spot, and it's characteristic of these um, younger, fairly rapidly rotating stars that are just a lot more active and have tremendous spot coverage. And that, of course, affects both the activity as well as the brightness of the star because you have these giant dark spots. You can really see that modulation going up and down. You, you also see big spots on stars that aren't necessarily rotating fast, but stars that are, are cooler. And yep. the, the irony there is the cooler stars, they're actually physically larger. And so the temperature gradient from the core to the surface of the star, it has a much steeper fall off. And the transfer of energy from the core to the surface by radiation isn't efficient enough. And so you actually get boiling, you get convection, that is a lot like, um, you know, if you put a pot of water on boil at, on your stove, um, you, what you'll see is all kinds of, of uh, interesting effects with the, uh, the, the, the turbulent flow of the medium, and that makes for big spots sometimes. Right, but although, um, you know, the, we, that, that critical mass cutoff, right, where the, the outer convection starts to pick up happens right around um, Altair, actually, we, we think you have a very shallow convection zone in stars like Altair. We actually observed it um, with our spectrograph. And, you know, it doesn't really show a cycle because it's got this really narrow convective zone. But both, you know, the sedate main sequence stars like the sun, as well as this beast, which is very unlike the sun, um, have these pronounced. Uh, and eventually, of course, stars just become completely convective. And then, then the, all bets are off for as far as their variability goes. <laughs> I'm going to run this movie one more time. This was done by uh, Rachel Rottenbacher, who's at, um, I believe, Yale University right now, uh, working with Deborah Fisher. Um, um, yeah, there's a couple of questions uh, on the okay. chat. This, one going, this is going back a little bit to how the interferometer is built from uh, Chris. Are the delay lines servoed for differential thermal effects? Oh, boy, we can talk about <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk about effects that you have to servo for. So... Um, the delay, so the answer is yes, um, but 
that's really the least of our problems because thermal effects, they're largely driven by the day-night cycle and they're therefore slow. Um, so they kind of operate on 24-hour timescales uh, or 12-hour timescales as far as things expanding and contracting. Um, the, the light, so, so the delay lines themselves, by the way, um, this whole laboratory here where things are getting put that together is fairly tightly controlled thermally. Um, we have uh, temperature control for the whole building, but then where we actually have the camera, the, the, the device that takes the beams from six telescopes up to six telescopes at a time and puts them back together. Um, we put that into a room within a room. And so we've inside the lab here, there is a room entirely built out of this uh, RMAX insulating material. And we neither heat nor cool that room actually, because we let it, uh, its temperature be dictated by the exterior lab, which itself is tightly thermally controlled. And so the temperature differentials in there are very, very slow. Uh, and so that's a thing that we've built for, but isn't that big of a deal. What is a big deal is, you know, I was talking about how we need to take the light from these, these arms and put it into the back end, and we need to make it so that um, the paths from the star, whatever we're looking at, uh, that go into this are equal to a fraction of a wavelength of light. So, you know, tens of nanometers. And the problem is, is that not only do we have the structure and the pipes and the, the, the mirrors, the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is a part of your optical system. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And the problem is, is that the light, when it comes and let's say hits the north arm here or the east arm here or the west arm here, it passes through a very different piece of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, as it is flowing over top of you, as it tends to do with regular uh, wind motion and so forth, it actually acts as a piston effect. And so the distance that the, the light is traveling through the, to get to the east or to the west changes by many tens of microns, so about a factor of a thousand more than you really want it to, on timescales of about a millisecond. And that's a big problem. And so what we effectively do is we run our camera at about a millisecond frame rates. We, we run them at about a kilohertz. And that way we can at least take a snapshot and measure the effect of the Earth's atmosphere and account for that with our delay lines here in the laboratory, with our pistons in the laboratory. We can actually move them at those sorts of rates to accommodate for the, um, the effect of the atmosphere. So. The, the upshot is we run the servos really fast. We can get extremely high resolution on bright things because we need to have our frame time be a millisecond. Um, I'll, I'll note, I'll, I'll have some, some discussion of, of how we're going to try and get around that in the future uh, with, when we get to the close of the, the coffee here. But uh, right now, that's the limitation. Sure. Um, we, can, we can go there. Um, Shortly, one other, uh, another question, um, actually a couple of questions coming in now um, from one from Christian Jones. Hi, Christian. Um, not sure if I missed this, but why was Anderson Mesa chosen as the location for Enpoi? Um, Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so 30 years ago, two groups were looking for a place to put their interferometer. The Navy had actually had a very successful run using a site on Mount Wilson which is right here, they had a little thing called the Mark III interferometer, which was kind of the forerunner to all these interferometers. And it's been looking at Mount Wilson to place their interferometer. Meanwhile, out at Georgia State University, they were looking for a place to put their Chara array. And the first place they were looking was Anderson Mesa. <laughs> and, uh, you, kind of the dictating things that that put tell you where you want to put your interferometer are um, basically, do you have enough area? Do you have enough space to park everything? Um, and so Anderson Mesa is very attractive from that standpoint in the form of, you know, it's a big flat spot. In fact, this goes for about a mile to the north and a mile to the east. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe someday we'll expand that direction. Um, and uh, and so that's a good spot. The, the other thing you want is really good skies. And so Anders Mesa is pretty good, but Mount Wilson is exceptional. It is very, very good. 
And so Mount Wilson has some problems though, in the sense of uh, it's much more forested and in with this image, it's much more rugged. Oh yeah. Uh, you sure. got to really work to put your, your thing here because this has much more topography. And so it's a trade-off. Uh, and in the end, for other various reasons, the two groups actually ended up switching spots. It wasn't actually an outright trade. It just kind of worked out that way. And um, uh, GSU ended up here with their Chara array. And then uh, the Navy Precision Optical inter Interferometer ended up out on Anderson Mesa. And so it's this trade-off between skies and being able to fit everything and then other secondary uh, considerations like your host institution and how you want to deal with them. So um, let's um, see. Can how to turn an interference pattern into a movie of a spherical object. <laughs> so the first thing you have to do is make an image. And so making an image is a matter of taking a snapshot. And the way you do that is you collect you, you collect the light from the telescopes and you mix it back together. Um, unfortunately, this is where it gets a little technical, <laughs> if it hasn't already, um, which is um, we've cheated. We have cheated in building our telescope and we have cheated in such a way that our telescope's resolving power, say here at Chara, is the, it's, it's effectively, if you were to have a mirror the size of the separation of the telescopes, that's kind of the mirror you get. And the same thing is going on here out at NPOI. You know, you have these mirrors that are sparsely distributed along what you want you to be your, your synthetic mirror here. That's the full diameter of the arms. But we have cheated in that we haven't actually built the whole mirror. That we haven't built a mirror that's 430 meters in diameter. And so, what you are getting is the separation between the telescopes gives you information. It gives you information of what is contained in the image. And it gives you information on uh, big scales. So, for example, when your telescopes are closely spaced together here at the center of the array, it gives you information on uh, the big stuff. So if you're looking at a lake, it gives you information on how big is the lake, what is the overall shape of the lake. Now, when you have stuff that's far out, you're gonna get information that is at the fine details on the image. So what are the size of the waves? How many waves are there? Are they big waves or small waves? But you know, on the big lake, you have little, little or, or big waves. It's actually possible to get just the one flavor of information and not the other. It's actually possible to look at something and be able to say, oh, I know what the size of the waves are on this lake, but I actually don't know how big the lake is. Um, <laughs> because you need both the fine detail stuff from the big telescope and the small detail stuff from the, uh, the, the short baselines. And so we don't actually have all the baselines because we've only sparsely populated this. And so there's actually quite a bit of image reconstruction that goes into this. You're making kind of guesses of the stuff you've missed. And fortunately with stars, when you're looking at a star, um, you can make a pretty good guess on what you've missed in between. Um, as far as, you know, if you can see a spot down to a certain size, but you know, the overall shape of the star and the size of the star, you can usually infer this stuff in between, but, uh, there is a bit of magic that goes into that. Yeah. And I think right there, you've kind of touched on a, another question from Christian, which is basically asking about the resolving limits of Envoy. What are its, what are its limits? And, and we could probably talk about both in terms of, of magnitude as well as, you know, angular size. <clears throat> yeah. So the resolving limit, uh, again, with, with all these devices, from the VLA to the Event Horizon Telescope down to NPOI, it's based on two parameters, which is what's the wavelength of the operation divided by the size of your telescope. And so as the size of the telescope gets to be a big number, then the resulting number, your resolving power, gets small. You're able to see fine detail. As your wavelength gets small, your resulting number gets small, and so you can see fine detail. Um, so the the limit with the NPOI system, um, we currently only use the inner part of the array, but we're in the process of opening up the outer stations here at the ends of the arms. We should be able to get down to uh, about a hundred micro arc seconds. Um, and so this is on the order of 
not only seeing that orange in New York City at the distance for Flagstaff, but seeing the eye on Sunkist written on that orange. Um, it basically means that we can look at uh, many nearby stars and see if they're big or if they're small, if they have spots, if they have the, this von Zeipel effect of the, gra of the temperature gradient from the equator to the poles. Um, it's a really powerful tool to, to look at things in the sky. Right, but the trade-off, of course, um, at least with the current um, Sidera stats on NPOI, is you're only able to look at objects basically down to the limit of, of the unaided eye or a little bit fainter because um, you don't actually have this 437 meter mirror. It's like you've got that giant mirror and you've smashed it and all that's left are these teensy fragments along yep. the arms and the Y. That's right. Any, any object you can walk outside and see with your own two eyes, that's about our limit. And, and th this is because even though we have very fancy and very, very sensitive electronic detectors, um, we have to take a snapshot every millisecond to keep ahead of the atmosphere. And so that really blunts our edge in being able to see super faint things. Right. We're in the process of going from our uh, current aperture size, which is about five inches in size. So it's about the size of a, a pretty small dinner plate uh, to bigger telescopes that are not the size of a dinner plate, but it's about the size of the dinner table. Um, and so that'll give us about a hundred times more grab in terms of the light. We can see things about a hundred times fainter with that. Right. And so we're trying to get those running out there. Right. So in the, the astronomer's crazy magnitude system, we go instead of sixth, we're now pushing down to 10th to 11th. And at that point, the, the science cases become much more wide ranging um, and much more capable. So let's, uh, you, you mentioned looking forward to the future. Let's talk about that quickly and then we'll wrap up with uh, a couple of final questions that have come in. Sure. So one of the things that, that we would like to do as part of the astronomical community is, is get even fainter with these sorts of devices, being able to look at things that are uh, even uh, uh, smaller and, and less bright on the sky. And so one of the things I've been working with a company here in the US is trying to put one of these things on board a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an interesting challenge because uh, when you put the things up in space, it has to be small and it has to be able to survive launch. And the problem is, is that interferometers aren't small. Even the short wavelength one, this you know, example here again is NPOI, you know, this is four football fields across. It's quite big. And so how do you get something small into space? And so this, the, the clever wrinkle on this that I've been working on with a company called Made in Space is when we fly it, it's small. It actually is something that fits into a cube that's about a meter on a side, so about three feet on a side. And you can actually get these outboard telescopes. These are the entry points of your interferometer. You can get them to be on long arms if you basically manufacture these arms once you get to space. And so the idea here is in the spacecraft, in the central part of the spacecraft, when you launch it, you actually have a 3D printer and you can print these arms once you get on station. And they don't have to fit inside of your rocket and they don't even have to survive launch. They can be very gossamer. And uh, this sounds very fanciful and very sci-fi, but uh, Maiden Space actually has multiple 3D printers on board the space station right now. And uh, they have a flight mission funded to do a similar sort of project uh, that'll fly in the next uh, 24 months or so, where they will print these booms, uh, not to hold a telescope on the end, but for a much more practical application, which is they're gonna roll out solar panels on the ends of these arms and get much more area for their, their, their and much more power therefore for their satellite than you can get with just body mounted solar panels. And so uh, this is, a, a unique intersection I see it of, of both sci-fi and and you know you know hard hard realism flight ready stuff that's that's ready to go and so it's very exciting to kind of sit at the cusp of that right now very exciting and and yeah the technology and the ability to do things like this is going incredibly fast which which I mean we deal with that in a lot of context obviously it enables really interesting stuff like this it also enables very easy access to space, say from the private sector, which, which is also you know, a bona fide double-edged sword that, that we've been working on a lot over the last year and a half. That's right. 
And the, the big advantage that you get out of this spacecraft and throwing it in orbit is these telescopes here, they're in fact little tiny two inch mirrors, but we're now not no longer staring through the Earth's atmosphere. We're, we no longer have a single millisecond exposure time. We can have an exposure time that is a second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds. And it makes it so that these two inch mirrors are equal to the largest telescopes on the ground, you know, the, the eight to 10 meter class telescopes. And uh, it's transformational. It, it actually will really revolutionize the, the high resolution science that we can do with in astronomy. Yep. All right. So let's let's go to a few final questions. Um, first question from Chris is kind of a timing question. Uh, and I, um, is it possible to use, say, an ultra fast laser pulse to synchronize multiple cameras for non co country? Well, we do have to do the timing extremely carefully with those those sorts so, of. So the answer is yes, but. <laughs> uh, so this actually lets me show Mount Wilson again because um, Mount Wilson has really been on the vanguard of, of interferometry. The, uh, the first measurement of the diameter of the star was done with an interferometer on the 100 inch telescope. This, uh, they, they strapped a 20 foot beam to the nose end of this about 100 years ago to give basically little outboard mirrors feeding the, the main 100 inch telescope and, and increase the resolution. And we're able to measure the diameter of Betelgeuse. We just had some some celebration meetings about that because it has been literally about 100 years. Yep, yep. And then in the um, 80s and 90s, a group from Berkeley uh, led by uh, Charlie Towns, who got the Nobel for, uh, for the invention of the laser, uh, put a interferometer up here where they did pretty much exactly what you're asking about, Chris, which is they collected light and they mixed it with a laser to allow them to basically then turn it into a radio interferometer where you can then basically do the combination inside of a computer rather than having to do it um, optically like we do at NPOI and at like Chara. Um, so it can be done, but there's a hitch, which is you pay a terrible noise penalty. And so even with two meter class telescopes feeding the back end, um, they could look at about the dozen brightest stars on the whole sky. And then that's it. They were out of gas at that point. And so it's, it's, it's a neat idea, but it, there's quantum mechanics is not your friend when it comes to doing interferometry in the visible. It just kills you with uh, quantum mechanical noise and with the fact that we, we don't have the same thing as a amplifier like we do in the radio, the, the, we don't have that in the visible. And so okay. that, that's kind of what kills us. Yep, um, good. Uh, I'll, one more uh, good question from Jim Henriksen. Um, have, have you done eclipsing or contact binary stars with optical interferometers? <clears throat> so yes, uh, there have been some, some interesting results done both with uh, uh, Enpoi and with Chara, one of the ones that actually comes to mind is uh, over at Chara, they imaged uh, Epsilon Aurigae, which is this eclipsing binary star that was a very mysterious eclipsing binary star. I think once every 27 years or so it would eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really unknown what the nature of the occulting body was. And um, I'm afraid I don't have any slides on that ready, but basically they made an image of the star, just like um, uh, can be done with this sort of thing. And um, they made a movie, uh, the way you get movies. And I don't think, don't think I answered, answered that aspect of Kent's question, which is you make a movie by just taking many snapshots and you stitch them together. And so they did this also with Epsilon Aurigae and they made an image of the disc of the star and they saw this thing passing in front of the star it basically was a, it looked they, they called it the finger of God. They didn't <laughs> identify which finger, but uh, it was this thing that was going in front of the disc. And it turns out um, you had a spherical star that has a secondary object that has actually a flat disc around it. And as that flat disc passed in front of the star, you basically clipped a band in front of the star. And so they made a movie of this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that you can only get 
out of actually imaging what it is you're looking at. It's uh, it's not good enough to use you know photometry or other sorts of astronomical techniques. You got to actually make the picture, and that's really the motivating thing for interferometry in general. Is you know you can do a lot of uh, indirect inferences from the brightnesses of stars and from the spectra of stars and you know other objects as well, but if you really want to understand stuff, you need to take the picture. Yep. Would have, uh, with Pluto, we would have never found the heart on Pluto if we hadn't taken the picture. Right, and our understanding of of Pluto or our ability to to explore what's going on is is transformed by having that that image of uh, you know yep. the heart and the dark regions and and you know knowing where all the the different chemical species lie. So if you want to hear a little more about uh, Epsilon Aragi in the observational context, you can go back to the first cosmic coffee of this year. Um, that's one of the near one of the winter hexagon stars, Capella, and we talked about um, where to find it and how to observe it. And those eclipses only come once every 27 years. And the last one was around 2010. So, you know, hold your breath um, and we'll, we'll do a cosmic coffee in 17 years on, on the next eclipse, I guess. Yeah. So now I'll take uh, one, one last question before we, before we have to sign off. Um, this kind of going back to the timing thing, Chris was wondering about that timing approach. If we're above the atmosphere, you know, the approach of, of um, uh, let's see, mul uh, yeah, timing multiple cameras uh, above the atmosphere <clears throat> where you don't have that problem. Yeah, you're still, you're still uh, trying to basically uh, mix the light with, with, a, with a reference signal, with a, with a, uh, a beat frequency, and it's, it's still going to give you trouble. Um, the, once you're above the Earth's atmosphere, um, given that uh, you don't have distortions between your telescope and where you're combining the beams happening on millisecond time scales. Um, you're best off just doing a regular thing as far as taking the light, bring it together from the beam on the other side and uh, mixing it together before you take the picture. Um, it, uh, that's the big advantage of going into space is these very long integration times that get afforded by this, uh, this lack of atmospheric disturbance. There's certainly going to be other disturbances like, um, you know, we, we actually spend a lot of time on telecons doing the design work talking about the, uh, the motion of the telescope at the tip of these booms because these are fairly gossamer and they're going to be waving around. Um, but the key there is that uh, a, an optic hanging on the end of a long boom may move and move quite a bit actually, but in contrast to the stochastic motion of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, a, a gradual motion at the tip of a boom is highly predictable. And so you can actually just track it out and get your long integration time still. Uh, yep. Unlike uh, move motions in the Earth's atmosphere, which not only are large, but entirely random. Entirely stochastic, yep. Okay. Um, so with that, I think we will wrap up. I'll just um, notice one final comment. I see Steve Ridgway is on the call and he ah. says that he knew you when you were a baby interferometrist <laughs> and baby interferometers. And somehow I have no picture, no problem picturing you with a pacifier uh, working on, working on interferometers. Um, so I hope everybody's, go ahead, Jared. Steve was on my, my, the, my dissertation committee uh, and he, he sadly could not make my, uh, my defense because this was in Laramie and Wyoming, which was a lot like Flagstaff, and we got snowed in at the time of my defense, I think it was, and he couldn't make it up, so he, he had to uh, appear remotely, which seems rather prescient nowadays. <laughs> right, and that is, that is how, it ha how it swings in the high country in the spring. That That's right. There's snow melting on the ground right now from the last storm. So with that, we'll say... Hope everyone's enjoyed this, this whirlwind tour of interferometers. It's certainly a, a very uh, a interesting and singular resource uh, here at Lowell that we've really enjoyed working on. I, I remember when I first came here in 92, I think they were literally starting to dig holes for the foundations for the siderostats, and, and it's, it's come quite a ways since then. Um, so as always, um, thanks again, Gerard, for all the interesting information and expertise. Thanks, um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay, well, stay safe. Interestingly, next week is the one year anniversary of Cosmic Coffee because we started doing these when we shut down a year ago for COVID. And we're going to do a little retrospective over the last year, talk a little bit about our reopening plans because with the, the numbers starting to recede and knock on wood, the 
vaccines and immunity starting to rise, we're, we're starting to look at phasing back into a bit of normality, which I, before the show, you and I were both talking about, this is the longest we haven't been in a plane in, in I don't know how long, but it'll be. Oh my God. It's yeah. It's been so long. And <laughs> yeah. so all looking back forward to getting back to normal, certainly wish the same for all of you. So as always, stay well, stay safe, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.